All right, turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We are going to dive through this entire chapter on this morning. It's only uh, 13 verses. It's going to, it's going to, um, it's not a big book, but it is a weighty book for us. And so I can't wait to dig into this um, on this morning. Um, this is a, a, a chapter of, of, that begins a thought that Paul is going to work through uh, for, for, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to work through. Um, and, and, and that is this ideal of food being offered to idols. Food being offered to idols. And, and, and what is the significance of that? On the surface, you hear it and you say to yourself, that really has no application for us. We're not really doing temple sacrifices and feeding folks um, whatever sacrifice that we have from the temple. But there is a deeper principle that I want you to stick with me on because there is a lot to be said in what Paul is teaching us in this, in this book or in this chapter, in these chapters that we're going to cover. Um, there are three things that, that Paul is going to do. The, number one, he's going to talk to us in chapter 8 and show us, or at least he's going to acknowledge that the Corinthians have knowledge, all right? The Corinthians have knowledge, and that's an important thing, that they have knowledge. But the second thing he's going to do is show us that knowledge is not enough. The Corinthians have knowledge, but Paul is about to show us that even though they have knowledge, knowledge is not enough. And then the last thing that Paul is going to do is he's going to share with us a higher good that we can pursue and a way that we can pursue it. Or at least we're going to talk about that way in which we can pursue it. So he's acknowledging that the Corinthians have knowledge. He is revealing that although they have knowledge, that knowledge is not enough, and he's going to give us a way in which to pursue a higher good, or we're going to offer a way in which to pursue a higher good. Now, what's happening here as we talk about these Corinthians who are um, asking questions about food being offered to idols? In the very first verse, Paul says um, in, verse, in verse, um, verse 1 of chapter 8, now concerning food offered to idols. Paul's words here again are a response to a question that is being asked by the Corinthians. Verse 1, now concerning food offered to idols. As we've talked about um, um, up to this point, Paul has been kind of addressing questions in, in for the last couple of chapters, and he's saying, now concerning this. In other words, you wrote about this. I'm about to give you some thoughts on this. Now concerning that. You wrote about this. I'm about to give you some thoughts on this. And now he moves to food offered to idols. Now concerning food offered to idols. For those of you who have been following along in this series, you probably know by now that pagan worship in ancient Corinth was, in fact, a pretty big deal. There was a lot of rituals that are being performed in honor of these false gods. There is uh, some, some of these rituals are even sexual in, in nature and explicit in nature. But also there's a lot of rituals of sacrifices and feasts that were held in honor of these false gods. And it seems that sometimes the sacrifices were made and then the feasts that were held in and around the temple where the sacrifices were made used the food that was sacrificed in worship in honor of this false god. However, other times the sacrifice meat appeared in the local marketplace even to be sold later for for just normal cooking and eating for the random citizen in the community. So there are multiple layers to this question that Paul is about to address in these next three chapters. Remember, I told you that, it's, that this question actually stretches from chapter 8 to chapter 10. But there are so many thoughts, important thoughts for us to explore here, thoughts that reach far deeper than, than just dietary decisions. These are thoughts about idolatry and faithfulness, thoughts about true wisdom versus accumulated knowledge, thoughts about pride and humility, thoughts about love. Nevertheless, as I mentioned, there are multiple layers to this question that Paul is dealing with. And the first layer is this. Public participation in pagan and idolatrous worship in which the Corinthians were participating in a temple ritual where food is sacrificed to an idol and then used, as a, as, used in a feast as a sort of consummating act of worship to that idol. Public worship, 
public participation in pagan and idol worship, and then the food that's used in that sacrifice is now is part of the feast in that temple, in that worship ritual. That's one angle to this. There's another angle to this stuff that Paul is dealing with. Private participation in a meal with unbelievers who have purchased some of the meat that was left over from Tuesday Temple Steak Night and, and was later sold in the local markets for just good old-fashioned dinners, okay? So you, got, so you got one angle, which is I'm in the temple and I'm participating along with these people. This sacrifice has been made. We are participating and eating the dinner from this sacrifice. But then we also have a, 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 a different angle where there's just food in the marketplace and some of that food includes meat from the temple, and people have bought the meat, brought it home, and they're cooking the meat, all right? So those are, couple, those are two, at least two angles. So the second angle, this, this idea of purchasing it and bringing it home, try to picture going to somebody's house for a barbecue and, and the guy bringing, and there's a guy that's bringing uh, to the barbecue some fresh steaks over from the market on Wednesday evening, after Tuesday Temple Steak Night and, and, and picture him going on and on and on about the great deal he, that he got on these steaks. And then somebody asks him, hey, hey, um, hey man, uh, did these come from last night's temple rituals? And the guy looks at them and looks at the people that asked the question and responds, I don't know, who cares? How am I, how am I supposed to know that? Who cares? Why does that matter? What do we do as Christians in a situation like that? That's something that Paul is going to address as well. And then this is something that Paul is going to address. Private participation in a meal with people who are now believers but have been so impacted by their former indulgences in that idolatrous lifestyle. People that live that life, people that worship in that temple, people who are so connected to those things that now that they are saved, and even though they are walking with Jesus and have freedom in Jesus, they can't eat food that even has a hint of being connected to those experiences. What do we do in situations like that? And why does that matter? These are the type of things that Paul is dealing with, and all of those things have relevance for us, all right? So you understand where we're going? Okay. So the first thing I said that Paul does is that he acknowledges their knowledge. He acknowledges that they, in fact, do possess and carry knowledge. He says in verse 1, again, now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Many people believe that Paul is pulling these words from the thoughts of the Corinthians. Maybe they've written these words in the letters that we talked about, um, the earlier letters that we don't have copies of. Maybe they have reported these words back to him, which we know people have, have actually reported to Paul things that are going on in Corinth. Maybe he's heard these words somewhere else in Corinth, spoken to people, uh, spoken by people from Corinth. But the point is this, in reference to the validity of the question, is this food bad in and of itself? Paul is quoting the Corinthians saying, now we know that this food is harmless to us. This food is harmless. There is no demon in the temple Tuesday, Tuesday night steak steaks, all right? I mean, steak night steaks. Does that make sense? There is no demon in the Tuesday temple steak night steaks. There is no demon there. They are just good steaks, and, and I love Jesus just like the next guy, and I'm just a little hungry, and I just want to have a good steak and just leave me alone when I eat the steak. And even more so, they're probably saying, and thanks to your teaching, Paul, we know that we no longer have to worry about this steak being clean or this steak being unclean, because we have what? Freedom in Christ and all things have been cleansed. And here's the truth of the matter. In many ways, they're absolutely right. If that's the thought that they're taking to Paul in their letters, then they are right. In Christ, we are no longer defined by the food we eat. We are not clean or unclean based on the food we eat. Jesus affirms that truth in Matthew chapter 15, verse 11, where he says, It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. 
The apostle Peter tells us about a vision that he had in Acts chapter 11. And in that vision, there is, a, there is all sorts of things that are brought down um, that, that God instructs him to slay and eat, kill and eat. And Peter says, no, 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 I've never eaten, touched any unclean thing. And God says, listen, Peter, what God has made clean, do not call common. And even Paul, so you got Jesus, you got Peter, and even Paul in Romans chapter 14, verse 14, he says, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in and of itself. So we know that this truth is actually true, that the food does not make us. Paul even acknowledges this truth in this chapter. Look at verse 8. He says, food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. Paul acknowledges that, yes, food doesn't get, get you in closer to God or it doesn't get you any Farther from, farther from God. There is no proof that you love Jesus any more or any less based on the diet that you have. Now, that might not be news to some of you in this room or some of you that are watching, but that is absolutely news to many people who hold to dietary laws and dietary restrictions. In fact, many people in Paul's ancient audience and many people even in our modern day audience would find such a thought deeply affected. But the Corinthians have this right knowledge, and Paul acknowledges that knowledge. Here's another truth that Paul acknowledges and that the Corinthians get right. Look at verse 4 of chapter 8. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real resistance and that there is no God but one. Here again, Paul is quoting the Corinthians and acknowledging that now we know that idols have no standing before God and that there is only one God, the triune God. Verse 5, look with me. He says, for although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom, I'm sorry, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. The Corinthians would have been surrounded by people who held to a a polytheistic understanding of the world, meaning that they would have believed that there were different gods that held control over different things in the world. One god may have reigned sovereign over war and another over peace, and one may have reigned sovereign over fertility and another over death, and and, and, and one may have reigned over, over water, and one may have reigned over land, and on and on and on you go. However, the Corinthians have come to rightly realize that there is only only one true God, and he reigns supreme over everything. There is one true God who has created all things and through whom all things exist. And that is the triune God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. So, like the previous truth, many people in Paul's ancient audience and many people even in our modern day audience would also find this thought deeply offensive. But the, Corinth- but the Corinthians have right knowledge, and Paul acknowledges the knowledge. Now, notice something. Now, I know we've covered some interesting ground so far, but notice something thus far. Paul is not really offering any big corrections on the facts surrounding this knowledge. There are no theological quibbles here pertaining to this knowledge. There are no technicalities to correct pertaining to this knowledge. From what we read in this passage, it appears that Paul actually has no major qualms with the details surrounding the knowledge that the Corinthians possess. So what's the issue in the passage? And this is where we determine that knowledge is simply not enough. Look at verse 1 again. 
Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. You know, the ESV, which I love, in an effort to separate this particular knowledge of con uh, this particular knowledge concerning food offered to idols, takes a little bit of a liberty here by placing the word this in this text. And dare I say, with my limited biblical understanding or my li limited understanding of, of interpretation and Greek and all of that, I believe it's a liberty too far. And here's why. Number one, it's not in most, of, uh, no, most versions of Scripture, even in modern versions of Scripture. You can look at NIV, you can look at CSB, you won't see that this in there. And number two, it's not the kind of knowledge that's the issue here. You see, Paul has not really had any issue with the kind of knowledge. Paul has another type of issue that's at play. It's the knowledge being severed from love. You see, Paul acknowledges their knowledge. The danger isn't the facts. The danger is that there is a certain kind of knowledge accumulation that can be established apart from love. And that knowledge, more often than not, carries or invites pride, division, spiritual abuse, and so forth and so on. The word phrase here, puff up, it means to inflate inflate one's own understanding of themselves, to boost up one's perception of themselves to themselves. It means to make yourself more important in your own eyes. Knowledge can do that. Not just this knowledge, do you understand that? But knowledge in general as the other versions articulate. Knowledge can have the debilitating effect of convincing you that, you that just because you're right, your voice is the only voice that matters in a room. And yes, I said that exactly the way I, I wanted to say it. Just because you're right. You're, you're, you, some, someone might be thinking, well, if I'm right, my voice is the only one that matters. And then you're completely missing the point that Paul is trying to make. It's not that knowledge is a bad thing. It's when knowledge is removed from love. Not only is it a bad thing, but it becomes a dangerous thing. Knowledge truly is power. But it can be a dangerous power. You say, what makes it dangerous? When it is divorced from a bona fide love for other people. One of the early church fathers puts it this way. He says, when knowledge is without love, it lifts men up to absolute arrogance. Absolute arrogance. Knowledge carries the power to free others, but when it operates without love, it will only pursue the freedom of its possessor, even at the cost of bondage to others. Knowledge carries the power to build others up, but when it operates without love, it will only pursue the building up of its possessor, even at the cost of the tearing down of others. See, this view of knowledge, however, is not only pervasive, I mean, uh, dangerous, but this view of knowledge is also extremely pervasive. It runs through our culture. The way, the, the way our culture views knowledge, even without realizing it, we've adopted that view of knowledge, even in the church.
We've adopted it from our culture, and it's been implanted into how we see Christian doctrine, and it's been implanted into the attitude that we hold towards others. More and more, I'm seeing Christians gleefully co-op language like facts don't care about your feelings. More and more, I'm hearing Christians co-op language like, baby, I'm just telling you what God loves, the truth. Saints of God, facts may not care about your feelings, but love actually does. Saints of God, God does, in fact, love the truth. But you know what he loves even more? Truth drenched in love. Truth robed in grace. Listen to Paul's words in verse 2 and 3 as he shows us the value of love. He says in verse 2, if anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. Basically, here's Paul's point. You can have knowledge and still be ignorant if that knowledge only leads to selfishness and arrogance. Are you tracking with that? You see, to embrace knowledge, even, even biblical knowledge apart from love, is to have a suppressed understanding of who God is and what God has called us to. Remember Jesus' words. Some of Jesus', and when, Jesus when, when they were asking Jesus, what is the great commandments? Which, which are the ones, which are the major ones, which are the priorities? He gives us what? A double call to love. Love God with everything you have. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and all the prophets. All the knowledge must rest on those two commandments. Do you understand that? Knowledge is not enough. We walk in godly wisdom and we walk in godly knowledge only when knowledge leads to deeper love and deeper humility and deeper sacrifice. I love what Paul says in verse 3. He says this, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Paul is making a bold contrast here. There are some of us who concentrate more on what we know rather than who we love, but that wrong emphasis can create this very sobering reality that Paul is outlining here, and that is this. We can know a lot about God. But if we are void of love for God and void of love for others in that knowledge, we lack the greatest knowledge of all. And it is this, to be known by God. You can know about God and not be known by God. James chapter 3 verse 13 says this, who is wise in understanding among you? Wise and understanding. In other words, who are the people that know, that truly know? James says this. By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Wisdom produces meekness. And then he says this. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast, listen, and be false to the truth. You can have the truth and be false to the truth? How can you be false to the truth? When your truth carries no meekness, when your truth carries no love, when your truth is operating outside of the confines of grace and mercy. And then he says, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly and unspiritual and demonic. Verse 17 of that same chapter, he says, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, then open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. That is true knowledge of God. You see, some of us have been fooled into thinking that wisdom and knowledge is just all about facts, that it's all about content. The facts that lead to selfish ambition in our hearts is earthly wisdom. 
Facts that lead to selfish ambition in our hearts is unspiritual wisdom. Facts that lead to, more, uh, to a more de divisive spirit is even demonic wisdom. True wisdom is not just content and facts. True wisdom and true knowledge is a posture. It's an attitude. It's a desire to see the good in others and, and a desire to see good for others. So, yes, pursue knowledge, saints, but not as a weapon to beat down your brothers and sisters because that's not true godly knowledge. Pursue to use knowledge in a way that is shaped by love and, and, and leads your brothers and your sisters to encouragement in the Lord. Now, there's one more value that Paul wants to bring under the value of love. Knowledge is not enough. Love must be anchored, in, or, or rather knowledge must be anchored in love, and freedom is not enough. Look with me in verse 8. He says, food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and we are no better off if we do. But take care, listen, that this right does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? Here Paul is taking on the value of freedom, and he's taking that value and he's weighing that value against love. Here's an interesting thing about this text there's a word in the very first verse of this text, build up. Love builds up. And then later on in verse that we just read, the verse that we just read, verse 10, he says, or um, yes, verse 10, he says, for if anyone sees you have knowledge, sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged? It's the same word in the Greek. Build up. In other words, love can build up, all right? Or a pursuit of freedom over love can also build up, but build up in the wrong way. Are you tracking with that? That you can build people up with love or with selfish pursuit of, uh, with your own selfish pursuit. You can still build people up, but you build them up in the wrong way. One builds them up towards godliness. The other one builds them up towards sin. Why is love a greater value than freedom? You see, lo because love is not just content with its freedom while others remain bound. Love is not just content with being at peace in itself at the expense of others in misery. Love moves from the comfort of exercising our own rights at the expense of others to the sacrificing of those same rights for the sake of others. Let me ask you a question. What are some freedoms? What are some rights that you are currently holding fast to based on your collective knowledge? based on your accumulated knowledge. You know, you know in your bones that what you're doing is right. And this, and this right that you're holding on to, it brings you joy and it brings you pleasure and it brings you delight and brings you happiness, but it leads to the stumbling and discouragement of another. How often in our homes, do we just hold fast to just being right? That the value is, that the value is, not, is not love. The value is my knowledge. I know I'm right and you're wrong. Shut up. Me and Candy don't have those kind of arguments. I say that inside. Y'all met Candy. <laughs> Y'all know I don't say that out loud. But, who, but, but how many of us are, are struggling with this knowledge that we have, are struggling with this freedom that we have, so much so that we're willing to hold that or use that knowledge and weaponize that knowledge towards others and, lead, and, and let it lead to the tearing down rather than the building up? 
then you don't really know what you think you know. Neither are you as free as you think you are. Now, before I go any further, I I do want to offer this caveat. There is a saying that can at times be true, and that is this, misery loves company, meaning some people will always find something in you to be offended by, okay? So when I'm talking about freedoms, there are some people that will just pick apart every freedom and be, and find, well, you shouldn't do that, and wait a minute, you shouldn't do this, and wait a minute, you shouldn't do that. And typically, these people aren't known by their posture of humility and weakness. They're, 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 they're known by their arrogance, and they're not known by their posture of learning. They're, they're known by their, by their posture that they actually know it all. And they, and they leave people frustrated in their, in their nitpicking and, and, and of what feels like every single action that someone does that they don't 100% approve of and agree with. And these are the people that you cannot sacrifice your rights enough for. They will keep correcting, they will keep objecting, and they will keep critiquing. And we must love these people as well. But we have to be careful not to be subject to all of their criticism. Does that make sense? Because that's not what I believe the sentiment here, I mean, that's not what I believe Paul has in mind here. However, I believe we should lean farther on the side of caution when we're talking about the exercising of our rights and the expression of our knowledge. Does that make sense? I don't believe that is the, the, the case, the caveat. I don't believe that's the rule. It's the exception. There are many other times where we should lean the other way and we choose not to. And sometimes we use the caveat as an excuse. Well, I can't please everybody. Does that make sense? Here's the danger in pursuing rights over freedom. Or, I'm sorry, pursuing rights and pursuing freedom over our love for our brothers. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 11. Look at verse 11. And so... By your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed. The brother or sister for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. You see, in showing contempt for a brother who is stumbling through their idolatry of the past, You know, we're saying, man, who cares if that offends you because you used to eat, you know, used to eat the steak in the temple and worship that false god, and and now that brings up, conjures up memories of the past, and and, or or that may even encourage you to eat that steak again as an offering to the god. I mean, who cares if you stumbled with alcohol in the past, and that ain't my problem. You know, so if you, gonna, if you come to my house, we just going to drink. We're going to have a beer. I don't really care what you experienced in your past. But who cares that you had a history of sexual promiscuity or worse, sexual abuse, and, and so, you know, you, you struggle with R-rated movies. Man, we going to see an R-rated movie, man. Forget, forget you. Who, care, who cares about that? And showing contempt. For your brother or sister who is stumbling through the idolatry of the past, notice what happens. Paul is basically telling us that we are now participating in a form of idolatry in the present. Did you hear what he said in verse 10 or verse 12? Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak... You sin against Christ. Idolatry. You say, what kind of idolatry? The idolatry of self. You've placed yourself in the most important position to the point where you say, well, hey, it's my rights. I don't care whether they're hurt or not. It's my rights. I don't care if it's sin against Jesus or not. It's my rights. And so in in claiming your rights from idolatry, (laughs) You're participating in idolatry. In that moment, we love our food more than we love our brother or our sister. In that moment, we love our beer more than we love our brother or our sister. In that moment, we love our movie more than we love our brother and our sister. In that moment, we love our right 
to a thing more than we love our brother and our sister. In that moment, we love our knowledge that there is nothing wrong with what I'm doing more than we actually love our brother or our sister. In that moment, we love ourselves more than we love our brother and our sister. However, since Christ also died for your brother, and since Christ died for your sister, and so since he died for them, when we love ourselves more than them to the point that we lead them to stumble, we are in fact sinning against Jesus himself. Whenever we exercise our freedoms in a way that will lead to the stumbling of our brothers and sisters, we are not only putting ourselves and our rights and our freedoms before them, we are putting them before the Savior who died for them. That's the severity of what we're dealing with here when we talk about knowledge and we talk about freedom absent of love. So how can we grow more in our commitment to love our freedom or, love, or to love over freedom and to love over knowledge? How can we grow in this area and grow in our commitment to love over freedom and our commitment to love over knowledge? Real quickly, look to Jesus. What do I mean by that? Jesus' Jesus's love of us trumped his knowledge of us. And Jesus' love of us trumped the exercising of his rights as the holy triune God. Jesus had perfect knowledge of us. He was right about us, completely right about us. He was right that we were sinful and, and we were fallen in every way imaginable. And, and he was right that instead of grace and mercy, with absolute, absolute, uh, instead of responding to grace and mercy with absolute allegiance, we would constantly stray from his perfect will. And we would constantly choose our own way, even when that way led to even more pain for us and more heartache for us. He was right about us. He has right knowledge of us. He knows us intimately and deeply. However, instead of acting on that knowledge and exercising his rights, in light of that knowledge, he forsook, he forsook his rights to judge us with eternal wrath and hell. He emptied himself of those rights. He took on the form of a servant. He became poor. He lived a life of humble and meager meager circumstances. He took our punishment on the cross in order that we might be set free. Jesus knows what it means to choose love over the exercising of rights because he did it for you and he did it for me. So every time we're tempted to choose ourselves over others, every time we're tempted to say, you know, man, facts don't care about your feelings. I don't really care how you feel about this. This is just true. Deal with it. Tough. We can look to Jesus. And we can find a reason to sacrifice our, our, our knowledge of a thing in order that we might fuse it and shape it with the kind of love that's going to live to, uh, that's going to lead to the uplifting of those in which we're speaking to and sharing life with. Every time we're tempted to choose ourselves over, an, uh, over the other, we say, man, listen, I, I know that it's okay for me to do this. Tough luck for you. You just deal with it. We can look to Jesus and we can find a reason to sacrifice our freedoms as he did for the sake of love. You see, the first question I should ask when deciding whether to give up a right or the first question I should ask when deciding whether, whether or not I should, I should let an argument go 
in order that I might be lifted up or in order that I might find comfort, the first question that I should ask is not, why would I give up my rights for this person? No, the first question should be, how could Christ give up his rights for me? How could he give up his rights for me? And let that question fuel the way that you engage one another. As the hymn that song, the great hymn by Charles Wesley, he left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all, immense and free, for oh my God, it found out me. Amazing love, how can it be? that thou, my God, should die for me. That's the question that needs to be rehearsed in our hearts. Amazing love, how can it be that God, my God, would die for me? And let that fuel how you exercise your rights, and let that fuel how you exercise your knowledge. This is what Paul has in mind when he speaks in verse 13, and he says, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Because my brother is a brother who Christ died for, and because Christ gave up all that he gave up on my behalf, if my brother is struggling with meat and thinking that this meat is going is to somehow tie him to idolatry and tie him to idols, then we don't have to eat it. Steak night can be vegan night if it has to be. Saints, this is the call that we've been given. Not to be right. Not to exercise knowledge in such a way that it serves as a weapon and as a battering ram. And not to exercise our freedoms in such a way that it serves as a battering ram but to let love shape and mold all of it in your homes, on your jobs, in your communities, and amongst the saints, amongst the brothers, amongst the sisters. Why? Because that is exactly what our Savior has done for us. Let's pray. God, we love you and we thank you.